Nowadays, genderqueer has solidified itself as part of a larger gender-expansive movement that includes similar terms like non-binary and pronouns like they. They, that's the pronoun Jacob Tobiah uses. They identify as genderqueer, someone who doesn't see themselves as male or female, but something much more fluid. Jacob is an author, TV host, and prominent social media influencer. They're part of a growing movement that's trying to challenge the way we think about gender and push for acceptance and respect. Genderqueer and non-binary people have never been so visible, marching in this weekend's Toronto Pride festivities. And in pop culture, the movement is going mainstream. For example... That smell of cigarette wafting off your beard is so hot. <laughs> Jonathan Van Ness, one of the stars of Queer Eye, just came out just last week as non-binary. Fashion icon Rain Dove alternates between masculine and feminine in their photo shoots. And then there's award-winning actor Billy Porter, a fixture on the red carpet in gender-bending outfits. He identifies as a man, but says he's had it with gender expectations. I'm a man in a dress, and if I feel like wearing a dress, I'm going to wear one. But non-binary people are still one of the most marginalized groups, and their fight goes far beyond what they choose to wear. A series of recent polls suggests there may be a generational divide, that young people may be more comfortable with the idea that gender isn't black and white and are more likely to know someone who uses gender-neutral pronouns. The Pope makes another argument just last week, releasing a 30-page document arguing that teaching kids about gender fluidity could harm them psychologically. Jacob Tobiah joins us now from Los Angeles. So Jacob, you're also the author of a new book, Sissy, A Coming of Gender Story. I was really struck, I mean, we've heard all of these stories of trauma, even suicide among people in, in your community, but you seem to try and influence people with, with humor and patience. Where, where does that come from? Well, you know, I would never want to downplay the real challenges that gender nonconforming and non-binary and trans folks face in this world. It is not easy to grow up being a gender nonconforming person in a culture or in a society that tells you that you must be one of two things. Uh, but when it comes to sharing my journey with the world, you know, I'm just, I'm a funny, I'm a funny lady, right? Like I'm, I'm, I, I can't keep my, I can't take myself seriously for too long in any given sentence, um, you know, and joy is really what leads my exploration of gender. You know, there's, there's another, another stereotype that is out there about trans and gender nonconforming people is that we are the way we are because we're somehow broken. Um, and I am not this way because I am broken. I'm this way because I am whole, you know, like I, I express my gender freely because I have found healing and because I'm reconnecting with the joy of what it means to express myself in a way that feels good. At the heart of all of this is joy. You were raised in the U.S. South. You were raised in the church. Mm -hmm. How did you manage all of that? Well, it's funny because my church, you know, they, they, they struggled to keep up with me, but they were never unkind to me. You know, the, the folks in my church where I grew up like really raised me. And as I began to explore my gender and, um, you know, my queer identity, it was just a matter of them kind of figuring it out with me. But that's when you mentioned patience earlier, and that's where I think patience really comes in, right? Because I'm figuring out my identity, and it took me, you know, five to ten years to really kind of figure out how I wanted to be in this world. So of course it's going to take everyone else a little time to catch up. Uh, I have a really beautiful, healing, healthy, uh, gorgeous relationship with my faith community. And I wish we told that story more often of queer and trans people really reconciling with their churches and learning to um, be loved in a more radical way. What do you say to the Pope, who just a few days ago was saying that teaching kids that they can choose their gender, that this idea of fluidity harms mm. children? Um, well, the Pope is wrong. Uh, <sighs> teaching children about gender fluidity is teaching children how to be more empathetic and kind and sweet and, um, and you know, gentle with each other. Uh, the reality is that God made all of us. If we're going to get in, if we're really going to get into it, you know what I mean? Um, like my spiritual belief is that God made me exactly the way that I am. I have no shame about who I am. And I know uh, that I was put on this planet and in this world for a reason. Um, and I don't think that any faith leader should 
should deny the divine worth of queer and trans people. Um, you know, we are everywhere. We are part of the human family. We are part of God's creation. And I think it's a real shame if the Pope can't see that. It seems people like you, there's non-binary people, they're everywhere. It's, it's you're like a huge success in mainstream pop culture. How did that happen? Is a big part of it social media? Has that been a big help? Mm. Well, social media definitely plays a role in connecting gender nonconforming and trans young people to each other um, and helping you know that you're not alone, right? Knowing that uh, there are other people out there like you, knowing that uh, you know, you can be embraced by your community, knowing that you can be celebrated in this, in this world, that, you know, right now it may be shocking for someone to see somebody with lipstick and five o'clock shadow or someone with chest hair and a gown, but that won't be shocking forever because we're here and we're part of the human family and we are beautiful and people of worth and we're not going anywhere. Jacob, it's been so great to talk to you. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me, Wendy.